Wake up every morning with just the news. All the news and none of the noise. Good morning, happy Wednesday, and welcome to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield here in our nation's capital. Tensions are high here today. The National Guardsmen have already been called here into Washington and have started to arrive. We're expecting 15,000 National Guardsmen heading up to the inauguration next week. And today, the U.S. House is voting to impeach President Trump for a second time in his administration. This is an unprecedented move. There has never been a president who has been impeached twice in his term. And here to break it all down is Justin Danhoff. He's general counsel for the National Center for Public Policy Research. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, Carrie. It's nice to talk with you. And Justin, I know we're not going to delve into the politics of that. We're going to get this later to that later in the show. But you are a constitutional expert. What walk us through the legality here, the time frame? So Democrats today say they are going to vote. There have been some Republicans who are going to jump on board, including Liz Cheney, the number three in the House Council Conference, and the the move here by Democrats. They're trying to push this forward as quickly as they can. The move comes after last night. Uh, the vice president, Mike Pence, said he would not invoke the 25th Amendment. So the House said, OK, we're going to go ahead and we are going to we plan to bring the impeachment. The recommendation for the 25th Amendment was passed nearly along party lines. It was a 223 vote to 205 vote. And uh, when uh, the vice president delivered his note, he said, hey, last week I did the same thing constitutionally. I did my duties under the Constitution, and now I'm doing it again. My constitutional duties, the 25th Amendment, is not to be used, he said, for a personal vendetta or personal vindictiveness. It should be used in cases of incapacity, and it was passed after JFK uh, and after his what he was shot. And so the big question here is the time frame. So let's say today, this morning, the House, and we might be dipping into it later in the show, is debating they're likely going to pass these uh, impeachment articles. What's the time frame for the Senate? If the Senate decides to pick this up, is there a legally required timeline or is there a, can, can McConnell extend this indefinitely? Well, interestingly, um, first, let's just step back. Like, the Articles of Impeachment, what precedent is this setting, right? We, under, under one of two auspices, these are, these are being passed. First is inciting violence, what we saw at the Capitol. We all condemn the violence at the Capitol. Any, any right-thinking person condemns the violence at the Capitol. But if we're talking about inciting violence, um, President Obama's rhetoric against the police led to five law enforcement officers being gunned down in Dallas. Should we go back and try and re-impeach President Obama for that? I don't think so. Uh, if we're talking about questioning election results and using social media to do so, um, who said the election was hijacked on Twitter? Well, that was Nancy Pelosi after the 2016 election, not the current election. So I think we're setting up a dangerous precedent if we're saying that um, broadly inciting violence, which I think if you listen to uh, President Trump's speech, it's hard to discern that, um, or questioning election results. Uh, we can go back to 2004 with almost every Democrat in America saying that Ohio was stolen by some faulty voting machines. So I think this is a crazy precedent that the Democrats might be setting later today. That, that That's the first point. But the second point is, it's actually not up to McConnell if we're talking about what happens in next steps. If the House does vote uh, to impeach President Trump today, then it's actually all in Pelosi's hands still. There's a technical aspect of delivering the articles of impeachment to the Senate that is up to her. So she can withhold those for an extended period of time. And over the weekend, uh, when this was uh, being bandied about as a possibility, uh, Representative Clyburn suggested that she would hold them for at least the first 100 days of a Biden presidency so that he could get his agenda moving first. So it's it doesn't have to go forward at all from the House. It can just stay in Nancy Pelosi's desk until she decides to move on it. Well, presumably Democrats want to get this forward as soon as they can. Although, can you can you legally can you retroactively hold a trial even after a president has left office? 
They can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I fully expect if the articles of impeachment are approved later today, if they're voted um, um, in favor thereof, that I expect that the Democrats do not want to muck up uh, Mr. Biden's first 100 days. I, I expect they will sit on them for that length of time at, at a minimum. I, I, and, I, and, you know, it, it makes logical sense. Um, from that perspective, if they really want to focus on their agenda rather than um, continuing to litigate uh, Mr. Mr. Trump, President Trump. Well, that's a very interesting theory. We're going to have to hold you to that to see if this indeed happens. We'll have to bring you back on that question. McConnell, according to The New York Times, is reportedly pleased, according to this report about the impeachment, saying that he believes it will be easier to purge Trump from the GOP with the impeachment. And it sounds like legally, from what you're saying, he doesn't have to have any compressed timeline here. And he could potentially, if, if what you say is true, that the Democrats want to sit on this, that could give him a pass in the sense that he wouldn't have a sense of urgency to try to take it up if he feels pressure and if secretly this is what he really wants. Yeah, I'll <laughs> I'll wait judgment on the the New York Times report on what came out of McConnell's office until it's confirmed by by other sources. We'll just put it that way. Sure, fair enough. Well, we do know that there are very big unanswered questions to your point on this question of rushing this through. Our founder John Solomon, his latest piece looks at some of the very big questions about whether the president incited a spontaneous eruption of violence or if this was all premeditated, pre-planned, and whether the fact that the the FBI reportedly knew that this was happening weeks in advance and reportedly, according to John Solomon's reporting and other statements, that the president was not even briefed about these security risks, so that the White House did not know about this. So therefore, this begs the question, if the president did not even know that there were some forces here that were planning deadly riots, how could he then be accused of knowingly inciting something when he was looking, as he had said, at the legal arguments here about what happened at the ballot box? He was bringing arguments before courts. Yes, he was frustrated. Did he go too far on Twitter? That's, again, for the court of public opinion and, and legally lots of questions that are going to be answered. We actually have to take a quick break. Justin, I'm, I'm glad we're going to bring you back here after the quick break to talk about big tech censorship questions. This is a huge issue for all of us here at Just the News. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Good morning and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield. Glad you're with us. We're joined again by Dus Justin Danhoff. He's the general counsel at the National Center for Public Policy Research. Hey there, Justin. So let's talk about this question of tech oligarchs, big tech oligarchs. This was a phrase that Rudy Giuliani just used in an interview with us here at Just the News. He says that big tech oligarchs have are they're exerting control that is untoward and they're a big risk to the country as well as China. Uh, so he's saying that the risks are coming here from within and from without. And the big question that a lot of conservatives and just people who are interested in freedom of speech, what they're concerned about is questions of illegal behavior by these companies. So what's your perspective on this question of collusion, because some have argued that from a just seeing how coordinate, coordinated the response seemed to be against the president, against Parler, against any number of conservatives or conservative platforms, et cetera. Is there a legal argument here that there was collusion of some kind? Yeah, so I think Parler is the preeminent example in this situation. So if you want to look at, and, and oligarch's the right term, I would say it's an oligopoly acting as an oligarchy um, in this situation. So first of all, shame on conservatives and libertarians who for more than a decade have said the free market will solve this, that there's no, you know, big tech may be censoring conservatives, but free market, free market, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, shame on us, any of you who said that, because look, they said just create a new platform. If you don't like the censorship occurring on Facebook and Twitter against conservatives, which has been happening for a decade, create a new platform. So Parler did. But then 
they disappeared parlor. They're like an unperson from George Orwell's 1984 at this point. Okay, so Apple, which operates in a monopolistic way, because if you want to download an app, it can only be done through their app store, right? Well, they went ahead and removed Parler. Then it was removed by Alphabet, you know, Google, Android, iOS. So they're operating in, in cahoots to ban a platform that they just simply don't like. And they're banning them for the reason that they don't like them. And now let's parallel this to how Apple operates in China. At the behest of the Chinese Communist Party, Apple, of course, deletes many apps from its app store, largely news apps, at the behest of the Chinese Communist Party. And specifically, they deleted apps that the freedom fighters in Hong Kong were using to communicate and to get information and to get news. And so how does that parallel to what's happening here in the United States? So clearly in China, Apple is operating as an extra governmental arm of the Chinese Communist Party acting at the behest of the communists to do what they want. Well, we have folks like Nancy Pelosi and AOC and Kamala Harris in the United States calling on Twitter and Facebook and others to ban President Trump and to take down Parler. And what are they doing? They're honoring those requests. Are they formal state requests? No, but the argument could very well be made that they're acting at the behests of the leaders of the United States of America. They're an extra governmental body at this point. Well, so, yes. also, what about the fact that these companies, Google, for example, they also get large government contracts, Amazon Web Services as well. Is there an argument to be made here legally that these are basically, because they get so much government money, is this government suppression of free speech? Or is that too much of a stretch because they are technically the corporations are privately owned? But does the fact that they get government money through government contracts give any weight to that argument? Um, that, may be, that may be a step too far because we don't even need to go there, right? First of all, they're act, acting in a monopolistic way. So antitrust should ensue immediately. Second, Twitter lost something like 8% of its value after it dropped the president, which was a huge draw for Twitter. Even some talking heads on some liberal networks have noted that uh, this might not have been a good business decision for Twitter. Well, right? that, so that and begs so, the question legally then. So not only Twitter, but Facebook lost a substantial share of its value as well. Does Is there a legal argument from a shareholder perspective that they could sue the management for their behavior here, especially when they leave other people on the platform, people who are, for example, the Ayatollah of Iran, who has explicitly called for the destruction of Israel for very anti-Semitic behavior, uh, you know, Nicolas Maduro from Venezuela, figures who are expressly anti-American and anti-human rights that remain on these platforms. Is there an argument from a shareholder perspective that these businesses and these CEOs are failing their fiduciary duty? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Lawsuits should abound from shareholders, right? Because boards of directors and management, their job under state law is to act as a steward for the shareholders. That is their legal obligation. They are not to act as an extra governmental arm of one party or another to banish. And for those, for those listening who think that this is just President Trump losing his Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, it's thousands of conservatives. It's thousands of conservative organizations. And it's happening all the time. And so, yes, they're, they're acting in an arbitrary and capricious way to appease a political class that has nothing to do with acting as a steward for their investors. So if you lose, you know, like Twitter is probably the best example because President Trump communicated with so many folks through that medium and so many folks engaged with Twitter just for that reason. So if Twitter traffic goes down and their stock price goes down as a direct result of just a political action taken by Jack Dorsey and his lemmings, absolutely the investors should rise up and, and, and file lawsuits. They, 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 should, they should spring eternal at this point. Well, and it's interesting you mentioned Nancy Pelosi earlier. And again, the piece that our founder, John Solomon, has out this morning raises the question, what did Nancy Pelosi know about this riot? 
Nobody here at this network condemns the violence or uh, it, it endorses the violence. We all condemn what happened. The Capitol siege. Every single person who was violently engaged in this riot needs to be held accountable, absolutely. But the big question is, what did Nancy Pelosi know about this? If we know that the FBI has said that they knew about this weeks in advance, and Nancy Pelosi, if it's true, she did nothing about it, the sergeant in arms uh, for both the House and the Senate, they declined the National Guard here. Presumably, both those entities spoke with Nancy Pelosi. Presumably, they spoke with her and notified her that this could be happening, and she chose to do nothing. And yet now, after this heinous act of violence happened on the Capitol, that she is now using this moment to pressure against freedom of speech. I mean, th these are big unanswered questions that we have to get to. I do want to point out that Gab, Gab.com, has resurrected President Trump's, at least the archives of President Trump's Twitter, and you can go to Gab.com and you can see the archives there of his old tweets. So this is from Twitter, and they've reproduced it in full from the archives. Do you think Gab.com, do you think they have any copyright issues, though? Could they face copyright threats from Twitter? Sure. Um, you know, it's... And, and we'll see how long it lasts, right? The, 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 the tech monopolistic nature has waited for their moment to erase anything that they disagree with. And by the way, they disagree with anything that's right of center. Okay? And they do it uh, uniformly. You know, Amazon through their web services, it, it, it's just wild the amount of control they have. So if you if, if you're a right of center prepare to prepare to be a that's actually what tell. All right, Justin Danhoff, thanks so much for joining us here. Thanks, Gary. We'll be back in just a moment with Joe Weber from Justin News with the latest headlines. We're gonna bring you up to speed on what's happening with impeachment. Stay tuned. Hey there, good morning, and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield, and glad you're with us here. And joining me is Joe Weber. He is the editor for Just the News. Good morning, Joe. So let's give our viewers an update on the latest here that we know from our founder, John Solomon. We mentioned it earlier in the segment, but I want to reiterate these big questions that we have right now. The headline says, Rush to judgment. Three crucial questions remain unanswered about Capitol siege. What did Nancy Pelosi know? Is there a prior plot or was was this a prior plot or a spontaneous riot? Were there inside facilitators? What do you think these three questions, how much do you think we'll know and how soon do we we'll know it? I think that the first one will be very difficult to sort of find out. That's an internal conversation. That I can tell you right now that John Solomon, our CEO and founder and one of the best investigative reporters uh, in the country, and uh, he has his full team of reporters are trying to track this down. We've been working, you know, the sources from both ends, from the Defense Department, FBI, uh, leadership house, asking these questions. It certainly would be a big revelation if we found out that House Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi knew about this uh, beforehand. And so we continue to endeavor on that. The other, Do you think, you know, um, Joe, do you think that because the Washington Post and others have reported that both the sergeant of arms, the leaders of security for the House and the Senate chambers, they reportedly said, hey, we can get the National Guard here. And the Capitol Police said, hey, we can get the National Guard here. But the House and Senate security leads, they declined it because they said they were worried about the, quote, optics. Presumably, Nancy Pelosi knew. I, I can't assume that they would have made these decisions without consulting her. I mean, do you think that's accurate? Well, I think that if you, you take the you know the path, the, the the fact pattern, and connect the dots, she's the leader of the house. She makes the decision. She's the boss. So presumably, she would know and would tell them yes or no. Uh, she she's the leader of the house. So I would imagine that she would have been part at least of those conversations. Not. Um, anything else that uh, I mean, she's in conversation with the house physician when it was the COVID lockdown and she's made up, you know, all those other issues come into play whenever they make big decisions like that. So I would imagine that she would have been a part of at least some of those discussions about security. Sure. And talk to us. What do we know about the Republicans who plan to vote with the Democrats on this impeachment question? Oh, there's four right now so far. Actually, I think it's actually five. Liz Cheney was the last to say Tuesday night. Um, and you know that she has the third highest ranking um, 
post in House um, Republican leadership, uh, the chairwoman. And this has caused a lot of consternation from a lot of conservatives, including Andy Biggs, who is the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus, is arguably the most conservative um, conference or caucus within the House Democratic Conference. And he's saying that she should resign immediately. There's four others. Um, guy named John, congressman named John Katko, Adam Kinsinger, which I think is a more familiar name, as well as Fred Upton is a more familiar name, and Jamie Butler, um, you know, and Kevin McCarthy, um, who is the House Minority Leader, he's still backing Trump, so you can just see where they're basically Cheney versus uh, McCarthy are playing the political odds of what their future is going to be in terms of, um, you know, is your political future pro-Trump or not pro-Trump? Sure, and that, that's a big question, and it's interesting, Politico was reporting that Kevin McCarthy said, do not condemn your colleagues if they do vote for impeachment. They don't want any more violence. Of course, we reject uh, and do not condone any violence at all. So just turning down the temperature here, uh, it's just it's so many big questions that are still unanswered. What about what do we know about the members of Congress who reportedly have COVID, who got COVID reportedly while they were confined during the attacks? Uh, three House members have said that um, they argue that they um, are they argue that they contracted it uh, during the lockdown in which they were forced to shelter in place in close quarters uh, with other members of Congress who weren't wearing uh, masks. Um, I don't know if I think it's in a very difficult sort of you know culture in which you sort of uh, point fingers at where you could have got it. Uh, that's a dangerous way to um, move forward on that. It's unclear whether that happened. Who knows where you can get it and how you can get it. There's so many people infected. Um, I wouldn't um, make that assertion until I was certain of it. I think that's only fair to your fellow co members of Congress and, you know, your fellow Americans. Seems fair enough. Uh, ask questions, don't shoot. Uh, so YouTube, we know YouTube has suspended the president's channel for at least seven days. It says in its, and this is the latest strike by big tech censors. Do you think this will be permanent? Um, I think that they will probably, I think they will, they will likely probably follow the path of Twitter, give them another opportunity. And then if it doesn't turn out the way that they want it to, if they still feel that the content that he's putting out is dangerous, then they'll probably shut it down. I mean, that's only a guess, but it seems like following the way the other uh, big social media platforms or internet platforms have done it, that's probably maybe most likely the way they'll go. And just thinking again about this impeachment, it's a historic impeachment today. It's the only time ever in the history of the United States that a president will have been impeached twice. So this is the completely unprecedented. What are you going to be watching for throughout the day? What should our viewers know? I think we're really going to be looking for what the House Republicans say when they make their floor speeches. I think that will be a lot of messaging. I think Senate Republicans will be looking at that and they'll be trying to glean what they were saying and the, take the temperature and the content and decide uh, how they'll respond to that. And that's going to really set the tone for how Senate Republicans are going to handle if and when uh, they do vote to impeach and then they send the articles of impeachment over to the Senate and they will have a quote unquote trial to find whether President Trump is guilty or innocent. And what should, in terms of the uh, path forward, what do we know about what the Senate's going to do? Well, that's sort of an open-ended question. Um, there's been some discussion that's, I guess, by procedural congressional rule, it has to go to the Senate immediately. The articles and the evidence are sent over, and then they have to vote. But there's been some argument that they're going to try to delay it for a couple reasons people have proffered. One is because if they can seat the two senators who won in the Georgia runoff, they might have a better numbers. Uh, you're going to need two thirds of the votes to do this. And Joe Manchin said that ye yesterday that uh, they don't have them. He's the uh, Democratic senator from West Virginia. But I don't think we really need Joe Manchin to tell us that. I just don't have the numbers there. It's about 50-50 and you're going to need more than 60 votes. So we have that. And there's been the other argument about whether they should delay it till after President-elect Biden becomes president and that making it less sort of um, not entering his pre presidency in, in chaos and turmoil, sort of making it a, a more smoother transition and addressing the issue later. Um, but this still remains to be seen. Well, that begs the question, how would that make your transition smoother if you've got this impeachment hanging over you and letting it drag on, which is apparently what Biden wants. And we reported here at Just the News that Biden said he wants to do both tracks. He wants to pursue his agenda and he wants to pursue impeachment simultaneously. How do you think that's going to work? 
Uh, not well, because if you have noticed before, uh, in the previous one in 2019, when they tried to impe impeach Trump, at least in the House, it took three months to, uh, to get that process going. And in the Senate, wasn't nearly as long. But uh, that's an all consuming task. I think really what he's saying, or at least to give him some credit, saying, that, look, please don't take you know, all of your time consuming uh, yourself with this effort when we have a pandemic and we have an economy that's struggling under the pandemic. And we have to, you know, and obviously he wants to have his uh, judiciary appointments as well. So, but you are right to that point. Uh, one does have to scratch their head. I mean, you can delay it, but it still looms over your head and it's going to come sooner or later. So if it's not in your first week, it's going to be in your second week. You still have that. You're still faced with that big uh, looming task over your head. Right. All right, Joe Weber, thanks for the update. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Stay with us. We've got much more coming up on this impeachment question. We've also got a pastor later in the show who says he's receiving death threats because he was here. He didn't even go to the Capitol, but he was here in Washington. We've got more on that coming up. Good morning and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield. Well, right now in the U.S. House of Representatives, there is a floor debate happening around whether to impeach the president for a second time in his term. Let's dip in and listen real fast. Worse, they were radicalized by the president, who intentionally lied to his supporters that the election was stolen and then told them when to come to D.C., where to protest, and who to direct their anger at. The need to remove this president could not be more urgent. He is too dangerous to remain in office. Donald Trump must be held accountable. He must be impeached. Gentleman yields. Gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. Gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, if we defeat the previous question, I'll offer an amendment to the rule to immediately bring up a resolution establishing a bipartisan national commission on the domestic terrorist attack on the United States Capitol. This proposed bipartisan commission will be tasked with examining and reporting upon the terror attack on our Capitol that occurred last Wednesday. The commission will be bipartisan in nature, modeled after the 9-11 commission, and will fully empower, uh, be empowered to undertake a full investigation uh, to ma and make recommendations to the President and to Congress. I can think of no more appropriate path for Congress to follow than by ensuring a bipartisan commission reviews all evidence and reports uh, back to us on uh, this horrific event. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of my amendment in the record, along with extraneous material, immediately prior to the vote on the previous question. With that, I, I urge objection. In, thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, I urge a no vote on the previous question. I yield four minutes uh, to my good friend, Mr. Davis of Illinois, the ranking Republican member on House administration, for a further explanation of this amendment. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I first want to thank the U.S. Capitol Police and the Sergeant at Arms employees who were here on the front lines protecting this Capitol last week during the unprecedented attack. It is imperative that we focus on ensuring a safe inauguration day, protecting members and staff during this time of increased threats, and making sure that our Capitol Police officers have the support that they need. We need to ensure that what we saw happen a week ago today never happens again. And there you Yesterday. have the floor proceedings ongoing right now at this hour at the U.S. House of Representatives. You can hear the arguments for and against impeaching the president for the horrific attack that happened last week at the Capitol. Let's hear some sound here from the president himself. He was in traveling at the border yesterday. The Let's take a listen to what he has to say. And before we begin, I'd like to say that free speech is under assault like never before. The 25th Amendment is of zero risk to me, but will come back to haunt Joe Biden and the Biden administration. As the expression goes, be careful what you wish for. The impeachment hoax is a continuation of the greatest and most vicious witch hunt in the history of our country and is causing tremendous anger and division and pain far greater than most people will ever understand. 
which is very dangerous for the USA, especially at this very tender time. And now I'd like to briefly address the events of last week. Millions of our citizens watched on Wednesday as a mob stormed the Capitol and trashed the halls of government. As I have consistently said throughout my administration, we believe in respecting America's history and traditions, not tearing them down. We believe in the rule of law, not in violence or rioting. Because of the pandemic, horrible, horrible, invisible enemy, and despite our tremendous success developing a vaccine years before it was thought evenly, remotely possible, nobody thought it was going to be possible. They said it would take five years. Sir, it will take seven years. All of our scientists were saying, our advisors, it will take seven years, five years, ten years maybe. Well, we did it just like I said we would, and we had it out years and years before they thought it was. And there you have the president there down at the border talking about this issue, talking about he condemned the violence at the Capitol. He said his presidency is all about preserving America's history, preserving America's heritage, not destroying it, not trashing the halls of Congress, as he called it. And again, his speech, if you go back and read the transcript, as he said in his remarks at the border yesterday, expressly in his speech, the transcript, you can read it yourself, the president called for a peaceful walk down there to the Capitol. Well, we're getting comments here from senators because if the impeachment passes today, and it looks like it will because the Democrats are controlling it, uh, Elizabeth Warren, she tweeted out a statement she said that Trump incited a mob of white supremacists and domestic terrorists to attack our Capitol. If Congress fails to impeach and convict him for this act of insurrection, it would send a message to future presidents that they are free to abuse their power to overthrow our democracy. On the other flip side, Senator Tim Scott, he is the first African-American senator post-Reconstruction in the U.S. He says that President Trump has eight days left in term and has promised a smooth and peaceful transition of power. The Democrat-led impeachment talks happening in the House right now fly in direct opposition to what President-elect Joe Biden has been calling for all year. An impeachment vote will only lead to more hate and a deeply fractured nation. I, am, I oppose impeaching President Trump. So there you have it. The, the sentiment among Republicans, Senator Mitch McConnell, according to The New York Times, is repeatedly pleased about this idea of moving toward impeaching President Trump. But again, we haven't heard this directly from McConnell himself. This is The New York Times reporting this. We will bring you, as we get it, all the information on the ground. Until then, we have a pastor standing by. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll bring him here to talk about his experience. Apparently, he's been receiving death threats because he was there here in Washington, but he was not at the Capitol. He was not part of those rioters, yet he's receiving death threats. He'll be here right after the break. Hey, good morning and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield delivering you all the updates here on this impeachment day in the House. In the meantime, I've got Pastor Brian Gibson here with me. He's the founder of Peaceably Gather. Now, last week, Brian was here on uh, Just the News. He was on my colleague show, David Brody's The Water Cooler, to talk about his experiences last Wednesday. But since then, his story has gotten worse. Brian, give us the update. What happened? Hey, thank you for having me, Carrie. Uh, I've traveled the country preaching the gospel and standing up for freedom of religion in America. On the 5th, I led a prayer rally there, preached the gospel to the crowd, saw, saw people born again. Uh, on the 6th, I got up, went and heard the president speak. Uh, it was freezing, so my wife and I, we went into the hotel to warm up our feet. We got the call that people have stormed the Capitol, which I found it unbelievable. I thought it was misinformation. I said, that, that couldn't happen. That's the most secure secure building the world there in session that that cannot be so i put on my my tennis shoes and i walked up to see from afar what was happening now let me say this the president never called for violence i never heard him say anything uh, to, to mob the capitol uh we wholeheartedly condemn what those people did those few hundred radicals that went inside uh but i walked up the tear gas was being dispensed but on the outside really most of the people were peaceable standing there i think this has been a spin the people at the top were doing things they shouldn't have shouldn't have went through those doors. You cannot do that. That's the people's house. That's like tearing up your mother's house. 
Uh, but since then, people took a pick that I took in Phoenix, Arizona, with the guy that's got the horns and the fur on his head. Now, be careful who, who you take a, a picture with, because they took that picture and, and a picture of him inside the Capitol linked the two of us together, and social media allowed them to come after me. They said, make this guy famous. Since then, we've had countless death threats. Uh, we've had thousands of emails. Uh, I've been moving location to location. I'm still preaching. They're not going to push me out of my pulpit. But um, I'll tell you, I'm being wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, around-the-clock security. They've even threatened my children. So uh, all of the social media platforms will allow this to happen to someone on the right, right? That They'll allow this. But they've deplatformed so many conservative voices. I think it shows their true colors. Well, we certainly did see violent riots where at least a dozen people were killed last summer, sadly, uh, after the wake of the death of George Floyd. Uh, and no accountability, no uh, you know, justice still is being delayed for those victims and their families. Uh, but certainly that does not excuse at all what happened at the Capitol. Uh, Pastor, I want to play some sound from a speech you gave, and I want to get your thoughts about it. Let's talk about it. Sure. I'm going to tell you, we need a brand new group of black robe preachers in America that won't be afraid, that won't back down, that won't shut up, that won't lay down, come on somebody, that'll lead the Christian army to our rightful birthright in this country. So I think people are latching onto that phrase, Christian army. What did you mean by that Christian army? Yeah, anyone that, that's been raised in Sunday school grew up singing onward, onward Christian soldiers. The Bible says to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We see that we're in a spiritual war. And America was founded by preachers. They spoke out against tyranny. They spoke out against uh, King George's overreach. And there were a group of men called the Black Robe Regiment that pastored the, the founders of this nation. So we believe that if Jesus is our king, then our nation is our responsibility. So uh, th there's all sorts of allusions in the Bible to a spiritual war. There's all sorts of allusions in the Bible to there's a force of darkness and a force of light. Uh, my voice was cracking because I've been preaching two times a day for like, I don't know, 14 days whenever they shot that video. But people want to take and manipulate the things we say and say that we're literally calling for a, a physical war and physical violence when nothing could be further from the truth. We're people of peace. We serve the Prince of Peace. But we do tell preachers, in light of our religious liberty being restricted, in light of the shutdowns, uh, that you need to stand up. And we don't bow our knee to Caesar. We bow our knee to Christ. Open up your church. Stop playing the coward. Play the man of God. Be a black robe preacher and not a yellow robe preacher. So I have, I have strong thoughts, but never violence. And I'll say this. I preach to Trump supporters. I also preached in the BLM riots in Washington, D.C., me and my associate, we were in there praying and laying hands on Black Panthers, preaching the gospel to Antifa and CHOP. I'm an equal opportunity gospel man because it's an equal opportunity gospel. Uh, right now we're under attack, but it's, it's vicious lies. And if people want to see what we really do, who we really are, they ought to go to pg.today, pg.today. And uh, hey, but we're here to help and assist the church. And what's your take on Mike, Mike Huckabee? Because Mike Huckabee is a pastor. He was on our podcast with our founder, John Solomon, yesterday. And he said that Trump has, quote, sullied his own good reputation. He said, we have to be honest. The last month has not been a good one for President Trump. He's sullied his own good reputation. And instead of using the last few weeks to celebrate the success of his administration and make the country really wish he was still going to be president, I think some of the rhetoric and some of it wasn't all his fault, but he's still being blamed. And the net result is people are going to be glad that he's not on the stage creating that, the kind of the discord. What's your take on this from Mike Huckabee, a fellow pastor? Well, I, I love Governor Huckabee. I've been on his show. I also uh, love uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, these, are, these are both just men but, that have different ideologies. Um, I'll say this. I, I, uh, I would have to hear more of what Governor Mike has to say as a whole. Uh, we can see that, that some of this has been taken out of context, used and weaponized by the left. And I can see where the governor sees where in hours like this, you have to be extremely tempered with your speech because everything you use will be used against you. And so maybe that's what the governor's talking about. I, I'd prefer uh, to get that from the governor's mouth instead of me making a call on a quote like that. But, sure. but I'm thankful. Well, and let's talk about just, uh, well, you know what? We have to take a break, um, but I'd love to have you back to talk more about this because we really have to figure out how are we going to bring this country together. Uh, and I appreciate your perspective. Thank you.
Thank you. And we'll be right back. Hey, good morning and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield and glad that you're here with us. So to end the show, I want to call to attention a petition that's happening at change.org. So there's a petition to award the Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman the Medal of Honor. So we wrote this piece yesterday. It was at 10,000 signatures. It's up now to over 15,000 signatures. And you'll recall that this officer is the gentleman there. You can see the photo there on the change.org petition. This is the guy who very quick thinkingly, he looked and saw where the mob was there going through the doorway. He looked over to his left. Over to his left was the Senate chamber. And he basically used himself as a bait, a human lure or bait to bait this mob and take them away from the floor of the Senate and take them upstairs so that the mob couldn't do damage there to the Senate floor. And so they lured, he lured them upstairs. This, he was by himself. If, if you've seen the footage on Twitter or online, it's incredible. I mean, it's just stunning the bravery that he put himself there on the line. You can see he's, he's holding the baton there. That's all he had uh, there, it, directly there um, against this mob. And he diverted their attention and he ran up the stairs and he lured them away. I mean, this is just an incredible act of what lots of people are calling heroism, uh, an incredible act of bravery. And so this petition is there on change.org. Uh, take a look, see what you think. Again, President Trump has said that he is all about law and order and that he supports police officers. He pleaded that there be no violence against these, against these police officers. Eugene Goodman, he, I believe, deserves this Medal of Honor. Uh, hope you'll take a look at this petition. Stay here. War Room is next.